possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. Mikey Stafford and Rory O'Neill with you as always, and we are joined by Colm O'Rourke and Eamon Fitzmaurice. Gentlemen, how are we all? Hi, Mikey. Good, Mike. Very good. It's great to have a couple of teachers with us, Rory, in mid morning. <laughs> <laughs> Must be midterm. Especially midterm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> lovely. We have um, our work done. We have yeah, our work do. done. <laughs> and, and, and principals, no less. So we're uh, exalted company. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jesus, they're poor. Your your students won't be having too much fun this week anyway. They won't they won't be going out and playing outside or um you know meeting their friends outdoors because the weather, lads, it's it's not due to get a whole lot better after three storms in six days or whatever it was. Um, the Met Erin, uh, Deirdre Lowe was on Morning Ireland this morning and she didn't paint a particularly pretty picture for the next few days. We're expecting a plunge of cold air to come down after a f- cold front clears through on Wednesday evening and Wednesday night. At this stage, we could get some sleet and snow showers and some possible accumulations of snow, particularly in high ground. Um, So we've spoken about this before on the podcast column, and I know Pat mentioned it last night, the fact that 40% of inter-county games are done and dusted by the end of February. But it's just bonkers for so many reasons, the weather being the most obvious one, visible one, and the easiest one for everybody to understand. But then the other things, which are just as big an issue for inter-county managers and for players, such as the Sigerson Cup, the Fitzgibbon Cup, um, you know, the short training run in there's now. club, there's club in there as well. There's club in there as well. And let me just see what we just had uh the weekend with the few games being cancelled. And as Rory pointed out to us before we started there, Galway, if they make a league final now, will play six games in six weeks because of this little bit of a backlog. And the only free weekend, there's no guarantees you're gonna get a whole lot played then either, is there? No, well the the climate in Ireland seems to have changed to a much worse winter and uh, early spring with bad weather in January and February. January was actually a much better month to play football. We could have had the league games and very good weather there. But this has been the pattern over the last few years. And it's something I've been pointed out to that what you're going to have is a much worse situation next year when all these extra matches are being thrown in into the early part of the year as well. You'll have a continuous stream of games for counties who are successful from sort of end of January until July, until the All-Ireland Final. It's absolute bonkers. Particularly uh, third-level competitions, you have the under-19 or under-20, whichever it is going to be next year, has to be facilitated there. And then you have club football. Already we have, uh, with Simonstown, where I'm manager, we've already played two competitive games. And that's another story. It's much too early to be starting in club football. So, like an inter-county season, I think, should probably... Uh, end of February, beginning of March, and run to August. I think this idea that you have to have the All-Ireland final in July is is not a good idea. Uh, like the vast majority of clubs are playing away at that stage anyway. So if the club championship in most counties don't start till August, the vast majority of counties are going to be out this year in May. All it's going to do is lend itself to Aer Lingus and all the other carriers to North America because every young fellow who's a student and has been locked up for the last couple of years, are going to say, all right, uh, play the first round of the championship, and then good luck. Uh, And I think that the clubs in North America already are gearing up for an influx of top inter-county players. And, you know, I wouldn't wouldn't fault them for that. They haven't been able to get away, but the number of J1s being sought this year and the number of clubs absolutely stuffed with inter-county players across all North America... Uh, this summer will be a sight to behold. We will be able to see a mini All Ireland in New York and Chicago and Boston. Yeah, um, and the the fixture calendar, uh, Eamon, is one issue, obviously, and it is it's a major issue. But just the conditions to be playing football in is I can't remember who took the line ball yesterday for for me Jordan was it? Morris. Jordan, Jordan Morris, Morris. Yeah. He, he took a kick a goal and he ended up chasing it over yeah. the, towards was, the corner flag himself I, 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 I was there for it and it was uh, the funniest thing I've seen in a long long time now he miscued the ball and he kicked it high but it went right back across him and out about 10 metres away from out at the sideline down the corner. Yeah, It reminded me Eamon actually of that social media clip that was going around during the last storm 
was a lad down in Kerry who kicked the ball oh, out right. to sea. I thought the same. The ball blew back. To- <laughs> blew yeah. That's actually that's actually Jack O'Connor's son, Ian. Is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Similar thing. I think Jordan Morris actually went after the ball. He was. He did. He chased. He, he, he kind of thought halfway through. He said, "I sure I can't catch it next time." Only after kicking us, but uh, yeah, no terrible conditions altogether, uh, Mikey. And look, I think every game that was played this weekend, all of us analysing it, we're kind of putting that caveat in that it's hard to analyse the games. It's hard to read too much into them because of the of the conditions and the weather and everything else. And. The, the other practical side of it then as well is that it's so frustrating if you're involved in a team, um, if a game, if you're ready to go and the game is called off, particularly when they're making the late calls. I remember a couple of years ago, we went up to Monaghan. We were due to play them in, in, in a scheme. We were ready to go the morning of the game. We we're having our pre-match meal. The next thing the word comes through, the, there was snow on the pitch. Uh, again, it was this time of the year. It was mid-February, snow on the pitch, game was called off. We had to go back down the road. Um, we actually did a training session in Dublin on the way down to get something out of the weekend. Came up the following weekend. Sigerson final was on the same weekend. I think we had three or four players involved in the Sigerson. We left them off to play Sigerson. Obviously, we weren't going to be depriving him of that. Lost to Monaghan by a point. And it was just all very frustrating. And when you're trying to do things right and the next thing, you're up and down the road. And particularly for counties that have, uh, you know, distances to travel, it's uh, it's it's unsatisfactory, really. There's, so there's, it's not ideal having games at this time of the year. And uh, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. None of us seem to know what the answer is. I think we saw during the pandemic the split season that it worked very well. And the clubs were delighted with it. But I think there has to be some kind of coexistence between the inter-county game and the club game. Yeah, um, yeah. That, 100% you know, you, in. You can, you can go ahead and play the games without your your inter-county players. Or if inter-county players are coming back from injury, that they play with their club and they get a bit of time under their belts with their club. But I think that's, you know, just completely... Isolating the two, the two, the the club game from the intercounty game, it's not great. And like Colum said, you will see a lot of players going to America this summer, and it is great for them to have an opportunity to do that in one way. Maybe Rory, you'll be looking to cover games over in New York for the Sunday game because there'll be so much talent and display over there <laughs> during the summer. It would make it would be the first glamorous trip that I would have ever had on <laughs> having been involved in Sunday game because usually the, the most glamour you get is going to Turles or Killarney. No, nothing wrong with those places as we know, but I couldn't agree more. I think the this was this notion of the split season and the way they've condensed the intercounty calendar was a decision that was made knee deep in the middle of a pandemic and in my view a lot of the decision making for everybody across society I think there was a rashness and maybe an irrational nature to a lot of it and it was a lot of the decision making processes in during the pandemic were very emotive because people were a lot more highly strung and I don't think this has been well thought through at all I think the coexistence absolutely has to happen I saw some commentary after the all of after the All Ireland Club Finals about how great it was, and you can't beat the club. You actually can. I mean, with all due <laughs> respect, the, I, we all we're all club men, right? We're all members of clubs. We all love our clubs. But with all due respect, no one cares. I'd say in in, in nearly the whole county of Waterford at this stage that Ballygunner were, were the All Ireland Club champions. It just doesn't resonate in the same way. And another thing that always kind of bugged me was that this notion that, oh, there's only 2% inter-county and 98% are club players. But hang on a second. That's not our entire playing population. Our, our playing population stretches from four-year-olds the whole way up. So, like, what we've actually done is we've overcompensated here for the adult club player. But what have we actually taken from the juvenile aspect and the sales pitch that we can actually make to these kids in terms of keeping, you know, keeping the games front and center? Who was it actually the most important thing? What what ended up happening was people got upset because the club player was getting a raw deal, but they trained their guns on the wrong target, which was the inter-county game. What should have actually happened was the guns should have been trained on profligate county boards 
who don't run a proper program of games within those counties. There was no problem in Dub Dublin. We're going <laughs> deep into the championship every year. They were playing into the months of October at one point. There was very little grumblings in Dublin because John Costello runs an absolutely tight ship. There's a brilliant program of games from high up to low down, and they continue all league games, bar three, without their county players. You know when you're playing. Everyone knows when they're playing. It's week on, week off, hurling and football, no messing. And those, none of those games get called off unless the county board says so. And you can't be shifting things around. Or, like, there's no messing in that regard. What we did was we've overcompensated because we all got very emotional. We all got very in touch with our community and our club, which was a good thing to happen during the pandemic. And we've way overcompensated now by pulling out of August, pulling out of September 1st and now pulling out of August to play our prime product in the shit and the muck makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I think it was a daft decision. Yeah, well, just to bear out that, and I'm sure Eamon would agree, the All-Ireland in September was a great focus in schools. Brilliant. And it gave an opportunity to promote the game. I remember we used, we every year would do a, a, a fundraiser based on the All-Ireland Predict the Score. Yeah. And it used to har, uh, arouse huge interest. And it was also a lovely money spinner for the sports in the school. And that's all gone. And the fact that you were doing something like that made more and more aware of the existence of All-Ireland outside the scope of those who are actually involved in the Gaelic Games. It brought it home to a much wider constituency. And it was a, an opportunity to promote the game. That's all gone. So, you know, when meet her in the All-Ireland final this this year, it, it it will mean that in September we won't have the opportunity. But I suppose if we're celebrating, we won't worry about it. Yeah. Um, Eamon, the, the, the more immediate issues that we saw this weekend are, are, are multiple. So, like, we can, we can joke about Jordan Morris's sideline, but match has been moved at the last second to... The like the the London Leitrim game we moved to the, the the center of excellence in Bacon and like that pitch still didn't look like it was up to much like Maggie Farrelly's first act as an inter county or as a Allianz League referee was was hopping a ball in the in in the square to see would it bounce and see whether the pitch was usable, the pitch above in Oma like there was a patch in the middle of it where you'd need a snorkel to get through it um like. This is affecting the quality of game. It absolutely affected the attendances, which kind of comes back to Rory's point about promoting the game among among the young, etc. If you had a young family, you know, I have a five year old, a three year old, and a one year old. Um, I'm not in the habit of bringing them to matches anyway, but I wouldn't have been bringing them out of the house yesterday, you know. <laughs> and, like, Mikey, and Mikey, one other point, because I know, because I deal with groundsmen pretty much every day <laughs> in my other job, right? So all those pitches that were played on yesterday are going to be in rag order for a long time to come because of the, the damage that they would have been subjected to. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just, but the, so you, it, it affects the, the far side of the line in attendances and, you know, you're only going to get hardcore fans at a match. But on the pitch, as an intercounty manager, you just detailed a, a chaotic week you had with Kerry. The risk of injury in a, in a tightened season, the, uh, playing on those pitches, and you probably can't train for a good few days after that, and then you have to go play on a pitch that's in a similar or worse condition the weekend after. Um, it's a recipe for disaster in a lot of ways, isn't it? It is, and I suppose, look, 20 years ago, a lot of pitches would have been like that at this time of the year, and it, even when you were having the couple of league games before Christmas, it would have been in heavy, heavier pitches, and conditions would have been tough and poor, but the games were two weeks apart, and that's just the way it was back then, but we've gone through such kind of a revolution in pitches in the meantime that players are used to playing on high-quality sods now, week in, week out, and um, yeah, it's 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 tough, and even the Donegal situation yesterday. Now they had they had a bad day out. They didn't play well. They looked flat and everything else. Bad result. Getting into a bus in Killarney after a performance like that, going all the way north, and then they're playing in six days um, against Tyrone. It's a short turnaround, and you know, for 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 amateur players, a lot of them will be working today. Um, I'm sure there's a few teachers on board that won't, that will have <laughs> a bit of recovery. But other than that, uh, you know, there will be fellas in, on that Donegal squad working this morning, trying to recover. They'll be exhausted for a couple of days and then trying to get up for next weekend. So there's a lot, there's a lot to consider in it. All right. I think most managers, be it at club level with a school team or at inter-county level, 
the, the, the two weeks is the ideal thing that, you know, if you have the every second week, um, you know, you, you have the chance to recover, you have the chance to gather yourself and go again. Um, no, it, look, again, players like playing week in, week out, but when it comes to six weeks in a row, you mentioned the Galway scenario earlier that if they end up playing six weeks in a row and then they've only two weeks to a huge game against Mayo and the championship, it's it's uh, it's a lot. It's a lot, and definitely for sure, injuries do come into the mix th- there. Then and wear and tear, fatigue comes into it as well. And fatigue. What about mental? Far. What about what, what about mental fatigue? I mean, they're in a bubble now. They're in each other's ear every day, every day after day, weekend after weekend. They're getting no break from each other either. Is there, is that a factor, or do lads just generally enjoy that? Um, do you think? No, I think they enjoy it, Rory. I think they enjoy it when it's like that. But again, just mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. the practical issues uh, for a management team now this week, turning around for next weekend, you're you're going to be trying to get your video analysis done on your own performance, possibly from, uh, let's say, in the Kerry situation, they're going to analyse the Donegal game for their first session in the week, probably Tuesday night, uh, have a chat about that. So you're trying to factor that into your session the players trying to give them feedback, but at the same time not overload them. Then you're looking at your next opponents. You're looking at Monaghan, who have played three games already. So you're trying to analyse their games, look at patterns, give that to the players before next weekend. So there's a lot. There's a lot to do in a, in a week, and there's a lot a, a lot of things to take into it. Now all teams are look they're used to it at this stage, and it's it's kind of um, it's 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 par for the course. But it is heavy metal. And it is, you know, it's fairly intense mm. when you're inside yeah. in that bubble of games week in, week out, where mm. recovery, switch from one um, t- performance to the next, getting ready for another opponent. Um, there's there's a lot going on. And Eamon, I, I, I don't know when you were playing, of course, it was a slightly different era to me, but the one thing that I enjoyed most when we were locked up together for quite a while was to get away and maybe play a league match with the club in the middle of it. And, uh, you know, a game with no real pressure on and you could just go out and go back to sort of being an enjoyable footballer again. I always found that was the greatest safety valve of all. Now, some of the clients that I had to play with, you'd like to get away from them anywhere fairly quick. <laughs> it's fairly hardcore type of stuff. But that was, that was a, another reason why the points you were making, yourself and Rory were making about some interspersing of club season with the county season often was the most enjoyable of all, maybe in April or May, go off and just play a nice relaxed game with the club and get the weekend off from the county scene altogether. Um, In time, Colm, and I I just think that, again, looking at it from the inter-county manager's point of view, there needs to be a bit of um, communication, cooperation, education around that, because I think sometimes... Like you said, in that situation where you go back as a player to play a game with your club, and it's just that play a game, it's enjoyable. But sometimes when players go back to their clubs, the next thing, the the coach or the manager has them running up a mountain. He decides that he's going to have a, a, a team building weekend that weekend. <laughs> and the players coming back to the, the inter-county set up carrying an injury or is wrecked after the weekend or, you know, that... It, it, there has to be that level of trust and I suppose communication and so on there once that happens it absolutely it's a great release it's lovely to go back to your club and play and you know the games when they were before Christmas there was a social element to it with the inter-county lads when you go back to your own club at the weekend then there was a social element as well which was just good for the balance of the whole thing as well yeah mm-hmm. yeah we, we we sorry Mikey me, on. me played a league match up in Donegal one time and some of the players got back to meet on Wednesday of the following week. It, <laughs> it probably wouldn't work very well anymore. But the fact that three of them were arrested in Longford on the Sunday <laughs> night probably didn't help their cause. <laughs> That's a different kind of team bonding there now, really, isn't it? You know, when you get a stump up bail. Um, sticking with the, I was just looking it up there, five and a half hours home that trip for Donegal last night, according to Google Maps. And I was on Google Maps, Roy, because we were chatting beforehand about the farcical situation in uh, the Camogie Club semi-final this weekend, where the match between Sarsfields of Galway, Northwest, and uh, and Shot Neil of Derry, North, Dead North, um, 
well, which had been fixed for for, for Clonus. Um, it was Cavan, uh, oh, sorry, I think sorry, it Breffney was Park. Breffney it, Park. It was yeah. fixed for Breffney Park um, for the Saturday. Was uh, moved to the Sunday to Gorey, which is County Wexford, everybody, which is southeast. It's North Wexford, but it's still uh, princely, two hundred and ten miles from Shot Neil. Um, and Sarsfield's manager yesterday, Rory, uh, on RT Radio, just said he had just no idea where Gory came from, and and it's none Hopper, of us do. But at it's the Hopper, same, wasn't it? Hopper, yeah, Hopper, it was Hopper McGrath, yeah, and he was on. Um, but you do have some sympathy for the Camogie Association because absolutely, they have no deck yeah. to deal with. They don't have it. any ground. I mean, I mean, you can jump up and down and give out about it all you want, and and it is it's dreadful. Carry on, I, <laughs> on a personal, like the first thing to say is. Camogie Association, this ties in actually to a certain extent into the motion that the GPA have put forward to amalgamate the three associations. Oh, 100% does, yeah. Because as things stand, they have, they have no legal access or rights to any of the facilities within the Gaelic Athletic Association. Now that, whatever way you dice it, is a dreadful situation, right? The only way you fix that is you become full members of the GAA and like it's a social democracy. So you're entitled to the same boys and girls will just be entitled to exactly the same under that. And, but they, they're going to have to speed that thing up. And that's basically the people at the top end all sitting around the table and just figuring out how to amalgamate three. And that will be difficult by the way, because you know, look, people have, um, people might feel there's different agendas at play. Big thing for me in terms of, and then from the Camogie Association's point of view, they're probably working off a roster of a number of particular county grounds or club grounds that they can look at and say, well, they're friendly, they're friendly, they're friendly, we'll try these. And they, it might have been a case of, look, we needed to get the game played. This is pretty, pretty, all the other pitches that we've rang and grounds have told us that their pitches are closed or their pitches are off. And this is this is this is effectively what we've been left with if we want to get the game played at all. So that would be my read on it. And I'd I'd hazard a guess given the fact that they took it all the way down to Gory, that's probably not too far from the truth. And I think until that situation is solved, on a on a purely sort of a, a personal note, what I will do is given the fact that we have a pretty good pitch ourselves here. Where in our club is um, you know subject to be getting a sanction or a ratification from our executive. But I am going to contact the county board and just say, look, in future, because where we are in Dublin is a really handy place to get to, and the pitch will be up to county standard. And um, we'll put it on their roster and we'll try and basically help if we can. If so, situations like this could be avoided in the future. Yeah. That now is subject to my committee basically <laughs> allowing me to do this. Oh, right well, now that's a grand <laughs> gesture made. Here we yeah. go. Yeah. That's una it. Luce, una voce. There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it just shows yeah. also the need. I mm -hmm. think like the way the weather has gone in this country is getting wetter in the spring. We need a, a range of all weather pitches all over yeah. the country where these type of games could be played. And particularly underage games, I, I think. I, I don't like playing on the artificial pitches. Uh, I don't know what, Eamon, your feelings on it. I just dreaded playing them. We seem to have a higher rate of injuries from them. But I think if you have a lot of these pitches that are around the country, it will alleviate a lot of problems. The one, the one, uh, and just a final point on it, Mikey, and the one, the one caveat that should be added, I just wonder sometimes in terms of, because... We had a couple of phone calls there now about hosting uh, Dublin miners, etc. over the last few weeks. And um, uh, and look, we had the pitches being available. We were using them ourselves, so we couldn't. But like as county boards and uh, Camogie Association, LGFA, they need to get used to, uh, like, they, or they just need to get Abbottstown into their head a lot more. I think Abbottstown is... There's so many pitches out there. The pitches are all sand-based pitches. They're pretty much always available. There's never going to be an issue in terms of them being called off. They're 150 quid for an hour. So, I mean, it's a really handy place to get to and geographically. I, that, that would be the one question that I would have asked Camogie Association is, did you ring Abbottstown on Saturday and just see was there a pitch available there? Because I'd be fairly certain that they would have got something. And mm. I just wonder, do sometimes... Not that do... easy, Rory, to get out of town. I really? know that from get, trying to get schools matches on there. It's not mm. that easy because right. they only allow a certain number of games per week and they sort of say, right, that's it. We have had our quota for this week to protect the pitches. Now, they have okay. a very good all-weather surface, which, mm. of course, could be used 24 hours a day. Yeah. 
Mm. It, it, Eamon, it, it's obviously not, um, this isn't exclusive to Camogie situation, uh, association. We had the very high profile case in 2020 where the, uh, the um, All Ireland Ladies Football semi final between Cork and Galway was moved from the Gaelic grounds because the Limerick Hurlers had qualified for the All Ireland final, which wasn't a shock. Um, and they needed to train there. So, first of all, you have that you know, the fact that the men's team are training, so a, a, an All-Ireland semi-final was moved, but then Parnell Park wasn't, was, was supposed to be used and then wasn't so playable yeah. and then had to be moved to Crow Park and it ended up the game wasn't on TV because TG Cahar couldn't get their cameras from Donny Carney to Crow Park. So, like, the LGFA and the Camogie Association, they get, you know, they get abused to, you know, and they get kind of belittled after these situations. But again, just to reiterate, they don't have their own pitches. And like the LGFA, <laughs> some, there are a few LGFA on grounds around the country, but they're few and far between, and they're not suitable venues for an All Ireland semi final. Yeah, that's it. And look, it, the answer probably is in the amalgamation of the associations. And, yeah. um, you know, as the, the ladies game in both football and camogie is getting bigger and bigger and getting more high profile and more and more kids are taking it up and playing it, which is all great. It's going to be, you know, the pitches are going to be needed down the road anyway. As Colin mentioned, those pitches, the artificial pitches, Kieran Donahue will be delighted to hear us uh, advocating <laughs> pitches, uh, th- those pitches that he's stuck in him- himself. But um, I think they've progressed, Colm. I think the technology in them has progressed. I agree with you. I remember training even on the myself and they were, they were hard on the body and they were... Um, there wasn't much of a give in them and fellas would go over in their ankles often enough. But mm. uh, I think the technology in them now, they are. That pitch that, that Limerick and Laos played in yesterday in UL, that's very um, spongy and the, the grasses, the synthetic grass is like real grass really. So I think the, the technologies in them have advanced. So um, as, as that has happened, I, we could definitely do with more and more of them around the country. But they are expensive. They're expensive to put in, particularly full-size football or hurling mm. pitch. and Over a million. Yeah, and oftentimes they're floodlit then as well. Um, I can carry in Tralee. We've, we, the county board have a pitch in, in Carcelee, and at this time of the year it gets very wet and heavy. A lot of teams end up using it to train in it. And I always felt it would have been a brilliant place to, to have one of those um, all-weather pitches, but it never happened. And obviously there was a training facility in Kearns then, and that swallowed up any capital money that you would have had for it. So, um, yeah, I think we, we need more of them, particularly with the way the weather is at this time yeah. of the year. So we might as well get on to talking about some of the football that happened at the weekend now, after all that, after putting the world to rights or pointing out all the wrongs, maybe more correctly. <laughs> um Look, we'll, we'll, we'll start with Croke Park. I know it was dealt with in detail on Rory Shaw on League Sunday last night, but it's very interesting. And you were both there, you, you know, analysing the game. Um, Colin, Kieran Whelan said something last night that got me thinking. He, kind of, he said Dublin have become a little bit predictable, particularly in attack. And I'm wondering, have the, Doug, have the Dubs stagnated or have they actually triggered kind of a revolution in Gaelic football where all, the, where all their peers, all their opponents have started to kind of look at the game differently because of what Dublin did and this this kind of revolution has coincided when the time when the dubs have kind of decided to stand still yeah i say that's that's quite true but the dublin were dublin were stagnating last year and their style of play i thought last year had changed from the time that they were quite successful like at one time over 2016 17 18 they were the most brilliant and accurate kickers of the ball and they made a lot of good scores from outfield by kicking the ball. Last year, they went to a sort of Donegal style round in circles pattern. So <clears throat> that has continued this year as well. Even though there was an attempt on Saturday night, I thought early on they kicked in some very good ball. But other teams have changed. Like I thought Mayo had definitely changed their style. This idea that they could be successful by running the ball from deep, I think they maybe have. Uh, realised at this stage that that is not going to be successful against the top teams. Like it was that sort of pro- approach against Tyrone last year. Uh, they lost a lot of ball in contact by carrying from deep. And it was very noticeable, I thought, the other night. Now, maybe it was based on the fact that they had looked at the Dublin full back line and a uh, perceived weakness there and decided to kick more. But it does appear as if Mayo have changed their style. Kerry kicked the ball quite a lot. I knew they're very accurate kickers of the ball. 
So the, 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 the top teams in the country, I think, have moved away from this rigid orthodoxy of short passing. Like Navin yesterday was just awful to look at. Short passing, short passing, short passing. Players are afraid to kick the ball. And the other thing what's happening too is full forward lines are now moving out the field to get involved in short passing. And uh, there is no targets inside. Like Kildare were quite effective, I thought, the first half when the Daniel Flynn and Jimmy Highland stayed inside and they gave in quite a lot of good ball to them. And the same happened in Crow Park on Saturday night. You had eight Norman Ryan O'Donoghue staying inside and, uh, there, was, and they, there was a lot of interchanging of men up front. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, there was an old saying, the ball always travels faster than the man. And uh, it seems as if a lot of teams are now going back to that. Yeah. Um, and yet we see, obviously, Eamon, we see kind of the Dublin persevering kind of with the game plan, you know, the, uh, as as Colin described it there, kind of this kind of Donegal style, which is, which works when you're five or six points up and you're preserving a lead and you can have Kieran Kilkenny touch the ball six times in a minute and he'll never lose it. Um, but there seems to be a reluctance to, before there was a reluctance to shoot until it was, you're in a position where I'd be guaranteed to score a point. Now you're seeing a lot more kind of, they don't seem to have faith in their system now because they're taking, there was like, Niall Scully took a pot shot from the sideline that I remember, but he wasn't the only one. And that's been their three games so far. There's been, they haven't even stuck to the system that Colin's describing that didn't work last season. Now they're they're doing the worst of that with the worst of shooting as well, it seems. Yeah, you, you've the nail in the head there, Mike. I think there's two things. I think, first of all, Dublin aren't winning all their own kickouts anymore. And that was a huge part to their armory because they had so much possession. They wore teams out, um, you know, that you were chasing them so much that come the end of the games, you were abs- actually burned out from chasing them. And they'd, you know, go up the gears and they'd tag on the points. And that's the way they had been for the last couple of years, the last three or four years, where they were getting a lot of scores in those kind of patient possession, getting the right kickers on the ball, opening up the shot and getting it after tiring out the opposition. Second part of it is they were brilliant in the opposition kick out. They're not as strong in the opposition kick out anymore. So they have less possession. And because of that, their game isn't as effective. And the other word you used there was faith. And I think the the newer players, the more experienced players, haven't faith in them yet. Um, because the last day I was looking at the game, I had a great view of the game. And it was my second time seeing the dubs from that perspective. They have players in the in in their full forward line. They have the bodies in there, but they're static. And I think they're static because they know they're not going to get the ball. So it's kind of the chicken and the egg. They, they're not moving. The fellas outside aren't kicking it. And even when they were moving, they, they weren't getting it. Ross McGarry was very lively in the first half. Uh, but there was plenty of opportunities to put ball inside. They didn't put it in. The only couple of times they put in the ball, it was to Kilkenny. They were willing to kick it in to him because they knew he'd win it and they trusted him. So I think they're at that stage in their development where the more established players don't trust the newer yet and the only way the newer lads are going to earn that trust is by doing well I imagine the way Ross McGarry played for the 40-45 minutes the last night he certainly earned a bit of trust um, the last day but um, yeah they're in a sticky spot why would you think he took him off Eamon I was surprised I was surprised Rory to be honest I was surprised it it looked to me because he didn't look like he was injured it looked like it was almost preordained well the, this, the, this that's, that was the answer i was hoping for because i was kind of say i was i was watching it as well and i was you know he was showing well he was getting out in front he was causing news he got a couple of scores from and i'm saying like okay if that was a preordained let's let's give him a go can you like if from a management perspective can you allow yourself the flexibility to change your preordained plans and 100%. say look percent Hundred percent. You have to. You have like it's it's grand to have kind of thoughts in your head beforehand. If this happens, if that happens, we can do this. We can do that. You know the what if scenarios. I imagine every every management does that. That you know if we have a black card early on, if it's a back, if we get a red card, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I mean, they probably had it in their head. We'll get another fifty minutes into Ross McGarry now, and it'll be good for him, and we'll see how he gets on. But. The fella's going well. You leave him there. Yeah, you look yeah. at taking out, taking off one of the other fellas. So, um, 
So yeah, they're they're yeah they're they're in a sticky spot. Um, they're just yeah defensively they're open. They're not. They're, they're big players. Are trying hard, but they're not in a great run of form at the moment. So there's just a lot of things going against them. So yeah, it's a big it's a big game in Newbridge now next weekend. Big is, game. But Rory, it doesn't it doesn't seem that it's a big game particularly to Desi Farrell because he actually said something that I think to most Dublin fans would be not sacrilege but kind of worrying. He said. You know, we're not in a crisis. We're we're building for the summer. You know, to, to, you know, the summer is our aim, and that, like I just don't think that's a, what you expect to hear from Dublin football manager. That we're fobbing off the league, lads, because <laughs> we're we're building for the championship. That's a, a weird thing to hear from a Dublin manager. And I and and it is. And I suppose the the most striking thing is the the how quickly the tone and the language has changed. I mean, it has been a dramatic. You know, the people were still, I suppose, going into this year's championship thinking, you know, obviously Tyrone won it last year, but, you know, everyone was saying, look, Dublin are still there and they still have the spine of a good team. And all of a sudden they lose four big games in a row. And, you know, and maybe the lack of recognition that there is an issue is something that could come back and haunt them. Because did, what do they say about the five stages of, of illness? Is Denial is usually the hardest, <laughs> hardest one to get over. So, I mean... Uh, I, Newbridge to me is is absolutely massive for them if they don't win even if they do win looking at the table even if they were to beat Kildare and below and Newbridge which is a big if now they're going to still be in the bottom two after that irregardless just because their score difference is so poor at the minute and then they face an Ulster a mini Ulster championship with themselves and uh, Tyrone, Donegal, and Armagh to try and save their fate in Division One. Hey, yeah, but wh- yeah. what that's that's going to be difficult. But what this also is highlighting is that the sort of era <clears throat> of Dublin dominance is over. The fact that they were able to sort of uh, re-emerge after one brilliant team with the likes of the Brogans and Conley and Flynn and those, and then they were able to uh, put in even better players with. Uh, Fenton and Kilkenny and Howard and O'Callaghan. Yeah. Uh, so, like that year is gone. This next wave is not coming. They may, they may have a, an okay team, but they're not going to dominate for the next ten years in the way that they did. It also means that the Leinster Championship, for the first time in living memory, could be actually competitive this year, mm-hmm. albeit at a lower level. And the other thing that's uh, sh- shown from the league as well is is how poor Leinster football is. You could see a situation where Dublin and Kildare go down to the second division and you would have no Leinster team in the first division for next year at all, which would be mm-hmm. quite a reflection. And you could have a situation where Meath and Offaly get relegated out of Division 2 as well, Colm. Like, I mean, it's, yes, it's and not you could, great for Leinster football. And you know? could have those contesting uh, the, the Talshan Cup rather than uh, the All-Ireland Championship. So, like... Uh, Leinster football is in crisis and I suppose it was sort of coated over by Dublin's dominance for seven or eight years but there's serious mm. structural defects now in the province and Dublin uh, the Dublin year is over so my idea of, of splitting them into three or four maybe won't gain as much traction. But it, the it would be a bit cruel at this stage Colin. Yeah but I think the same principle still applies yeah. and, and it yeah. should be looked on at under. The foundations are still there. Yeah. yeah, that underage, this under-17 competition, and I hope that it comes through, that it's looked on more as a development competition than a serious one, where Dublin and Cork and Galway and other places can put in more than one team. Correct, yeah. The, mm. the, the only thing I'd say in Desi Farr's defence, lads, and I, I've been there, and look, he is looking at the big picture, and he is still saying, if I have everyone back playing well, we will still take a lot of beating and they will and their better players are older and so on and so forth. But I think in a strange kind of way, this is giving them a bit of an angle. This is giving the, the likes of James McCarthy, who's on the outside looking in. He's not liking what he's seeing at the moment. And when he eventually gets back and when they eventually get their ducks in a row and they have they have time to do that for a run at the championship. Um, the league is, you know, more or less gone for them now in terms of winning the league. So I, I still, I still think that they're going to be a big factor come championship. That I remember in twenty thirteen, it was my first year in charge. We lost 
the first four league games and there was no panic. Well, we Marty, panic Marty was we, sent we, down crisis in Kerry, wasn't he? Marty yeah, was sent down to yeah, yeah. We had We had all that going on, but <laughs> there was zero panic within the camp. We knew we were working towards something for the summer. Um, we knew that once we had everyone back and if we'd everyone fit, we would be we would be well there. And again, we had a lot of our better players were getting older to stage. We were bringing through a lot, a lot of the younger lads as well. And we 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 got to North Ireland semi final and we put it up to Dublin. Um, with a small bit of luck, we could have won it on the day, but we didn't. So I see a lot of similarities with that 2013 thing. I think that there will be still a sting in them, and I wouldn't I wouldn't write them off completely for the championship. The next day out. Rory is obviously in Newbridge, which has kind of become like this this little like theatre off Broadway where lots of monumental things happen in in the Gaelic football season. So it's it's uh, it's Dublin's next last stand is in Kildare. But Kildare yesterday were involved in a in a cracker of a game above Venoma, um, which they should have won. I think Kildare, there's a very good chance they're going to get relegated, but they're learning some very valuable, very costly lessons here, and um, like they should have scored two goals in the last the last five minutes of the game. Derek Kerwin. People said it was a great save by Morgan, but it was made a oh, pretty, it was, straight, it was pretty straight. made pretty easy for him. And then Daniel Flynn, who was the one Kildare player you want through on goal, blasts over the bar with basically, you know, the goal gaping as well. Um they did so much well in that game and they lost to the All Ireland champions. There's no great shame in that, but I don't know, they could they should give the dubs a rattle, is what I'm trying to get to here. I I think they will, but I I still I was kind of left feeling slightly bereft yesterday after I watched it because I was saying to myself, this is a game now for Kildare. Like you've Tyrone playing Sean of, you know, four maybe, you know, first first choice players. Um, it's a bad enough day. It'll say a lot about Kildare's character to go up to Oma and to win. They were the better team, in my view, for most of the game. They just lacked that little bit of a... And, and like... You know, Tyrone took their chances when they were presented to them. Kildare maybe not so much on the other the other end. And um, I, I, if like if if you were if you were to compare Glenn Ryan and Anthony Rainbow to Fargal Logan and Brian Dewar, I'd imagine the two Tyrone lads are getting up this morning. You know, quite happy because considering what they managed to eke out there, not really playing particularly well and missing loads of lads and building again whereas Kildare will say to themselves like how often has that happened to Kildare sites where they've played really well huffed and puffed and then they get to the very you know just the very last couple of minutes and they can't dig out a game that they maybe should have won and I, I it, it would just have me a small bit concerned for them long term in that are they going to end up being relegated then become one of these yo-yo teams that back down to division two how much will that stunt them it might not I mean has it affected Ross Common? Probably not, but I, I think if they were to really have kicked on and to really kind of, you know, stick their hands up, I think they really needed to win yesterday and fortunately they couldn't get it done. It's a case of, Colm, is this a case of a, a team that's kind of gone soft or lost its edge playing in the Leinster Championship coming up against a team who are all Ireland champions but who are... Tyrone are used to every game being an absolute an absolute battle, and perhaps there is Meath, Kildare, Westmeath, Leash. There's there's just a certain edge gone from these teams in Leinster after fifteen years under the jackboot. Yeah, I think there is. <clears throat> I think a lot of counties in Leinster lost hope for the last sort of ten or fifteen years, and uh, maybe it's re-emerging. But Kildare have an awful lot of very good individual players. I think yeah. they have more better individual players than any other county in Leinster with the exception of Dublin and they should be should have performed better but I think uh, mood and management and everything like that is important and I think with Glenn Ryan and Anthony Rainbow and Dermot Early and John Doyle in charge there I think that has given them a bit of sort of local boost as well and uh, I think those fellas will get the best out of this Kildare team. It's a tough learning process, Division 1. Everybody finds that. But like that's where you need to be if you're serious about winning a provincial championship or, or the All-Ireland. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think that when Kildare get away from yesterday, I think that they'll be disappointed with not losing. But at least they know that they are going in the right direction. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, do I take it from what you said earlier, Eamon? You, you were in Killarney yesterday, were you? 
No, I no. saw it on TV last you night. Saw, um, you saw it on TV. Um, well, I, I don't know how, how informed we can be on this, but it's an interesting point I saw raised. I think it was Owen Cormack in, in, in The Examiner. He said, Kerry, you're doing so much right at the moment and there's lots to be happy about, but I still haven't figured out their their kick-out kind of tactic, what they're doing. I don't know whether it was down to conditions yesterday or not, but he said an awful lot of kick-outs ended up just kind of being hoofed into the sky. And I don't know if, I don't know if yesterday was the day for hoofing a ball into the sky. Is that something you've noticed? Is it still something Jack's trying to crack? I think it's something they'll be working working on right up into the champ- championship. And it often is something that's finessed toward, towards the championship rather than spending too much time in it early in the year. Shane Ryan was in for his first game of the year uh, this weekend. And I think conditions absolutely played a part. It was a day to get, get it out and not to be tricking around too much with it, particularly when you're playing into the wind. Um, I think the fact that... Um, the Donegal midfield, McFadden and McGee did well, probably, you know, made the kickouts look a bit worse than there was. I'd I give the goalies a bit of slack yesterday, yeah. I have to say, because it <laughs> was a tough very, day, tough day for goalie. It was tough, it was a tough day, and they probably made a decision beforehand that look, we're going to go out long, we're going to try and get bodies in around the breaks and and take it from there. Um, I wouldn't read too much into it at the moment, Mikey. I think it's something they'll work on as as they go on. Um, but uh, again, conditions played a big part yesterday. To the man of the match so far in the league is the wind, because <laughs> it's it's the it's the most important factor in nearly every game. It's hilarious when you look at the score lines coming in, because you see, you know, you'd see the half time the, and the full time. You know, you just know, you know, you know, as the wind without even seeing the game. Like it's yeah, but I think another factor there too is the team that plays with the wind in the first half. They've been winning about seventy five percent of the games. It's quite difficult if a team gets one eight, uh, one or two points up at half time. It's proven very difficult for teams to get it Clark back. back yeah. Uh, yeah. And on the kick, the kick out thing, like a lot of the kick out problems, it depends on the opposition. Uh, like Kildare gave Tyrone the kick out for a lot of the second half of yesterday. They just retreated on mass. Uh, and if you push up, obviously it makes life more difficult for the goalie. But Teams who were facing the wind and when the goalie was kicking with the wind, a lot of teams gave them the ball and retreated. Yeah. Um, a word on Donegal, Rory. They're, they've got three points, which is yep. kind of... But they yesterday was a bad outing, as we said. They had a five and a half hour trip home yesterday, which wouldn't have put them in any better a mood. And they're welcoming the... Um, the All Ireland champions to Battle Buffet, Buffet on Saturday, Saturday, Saturday night. night. Yeah. It's not getting any easier for them. Yeah, no, live on RT. Now, look, the one thing you would have to min- you would have to caveat any, but I mean, I would say Charlie Ha. He was in his pomp the last time somebody went down to Killarney and came out with a win. So <laughs> I don't think Donny Gall should be getting too upset about that. You just, just I, I don't know anyone that's ever like. Maybe Dublin in the last... Oh, we've last... lost a few. We've lost a few. Right? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. In the league. Ross Common beat us there in 2016. Um, you can actually remember them. That Derry, Derry, <laughs> Derry beat us there in 2014. Dubs yeah. beat us in 2013. So yeah. we've lost but a few it, down there. All right, it, yeah. It, it doesn't happen that often, though, I suppose, is the point. And I, like, and I suppose, look, it's a lot, they won't be getting too worried just as of yet. I think to have, to have three points on the board, I think of the four matches that they've left, I think, uh, sorry, three games, they have two at home. So, uh, look, I think Donegal will be all right. Uh, they, they, given the fact that the start of the league, we were kind of saying that they might have been a team that could have ended up in relegation bother. But that was obviously before we saw the farm at Dublin. Um, one concern, I suppose, from their point of view is there was no sign of Michael Murphy again yesterday. And it would be interesting to see how serious that injury it is that he picked up. Um, also, you know, look, the other leaders that they had, I thought um, Tom O'Sullivan did an unbelievable job on Ryan McHugh once he snuffed out of a game. You know, it, have they got the kind of creativity that they're going to need to get that ball in? Um, McBrearty was quiet, but like, I mean, look, as I said, I think the story really from yesterday was more the form of Kerry to be playing this well this time of the year. And as Pat said last night on the TV, the reality, as we know, with Kerry is um, once the ground hardens up and the ball starts moving a little bit faster, generally speaking, they only get better. 
one point I'd like to ask the two lads on though, and this was I was watching it yesterday, and I mean, look, it was interesting. Firstly, when Clifford came on the big chair, because obviously, like, you know, people are probably just going to watch Kerry these days just to watch David Clifford and rightly so he's that special but he has an uncanny knack right of picking the ball up we'll say in the right half forward position where you're thinking to yourself this is completely innocuous he has you know it's there's no danger whatsoever and then all of a sudden whether it's a drop of a shoulder whether it's a dummy solo or a dummy bounce he's all of a sudden he's bearing down on goal he it's it's, it's just incredible how he's able to sort of create that space. And the one thing that I did notice then was the carry forwards are very quick to empty out that for him. Like, is that something that they would work on? Or is that just, is that just something like it's Clifford get out of his way type thing? Um, yeah, I'd say that, look, I, I saw at one stage, Tony Brosnan um, kind of emptied out space for him and he'd be very clever, instinctive, um, forward as well and he'd understand that you know that when David is on the ball to give him that bit of space to operate in and in fairness to David he's not selfish either he, he, no. he'll do the same thing for you if it's the right thing as well um, just on Tony Brasson he gave a lovely hand pass a soft hand pass over the top to Shawnee Shea for Shawnee Shea's last point I don't know if you saw it, it was a fantastic hand pass bearing in mind the conditions uh, he put Shawnee Shea through and Shawnee Shea uh, elected to punch it over the bar, but David Clifford, yeah, has that ability mm. to suck a player in and then he goes past him because he's he's quick, but he's also so powerful. Mm. He's very he's very strong mm. and mm. Uh, he has those couple of yards. The point he kicked, you know, McMenamin was quite close to him and the next thing he, he got a good, he got three or four yards of separation to open it up for himself. So he's just very good at doing that and... Uh, then when he gets onto the left leg, most times he is going to score. Yeah, and and j- just just the last thing on that he got. Sorry, Mikey, it was just one mm. other point that I had, which was, I mean, I think Kerry hit the crossbar twice in the second half alone. They had another really good chance with Jack Barry, where he, he just the ball just drifted wide. I mean, it, to a certain extent, you know, on another day, Donegal might have been on the end of what the kind of hiding that Tyrone took down in Killarney. Um, last year they didn't and I think that's a positive because that can be quite a demoralising defeat now look as we know Tyrone recovered from it quite well to be fair but at the same time when if you if they could have got a pasting and they didn't and I think that's yeah. uh, one positive for them to take Kerry, Kerry will be hoping that uh, David Clifford isn't one of these students who decides he's going to go off to America for the summer <laughs> <laughs> no fear Colum, no fear no. I, I'd, I'd say he surrendered it. his passport. Yeah, <laughs> and confiscated my key. <laughs> when you see, when you see the bad weather too, like the financial suicide of the GEA of having games at this time of That's year. That's another thing. Like, yeah, like David Clifford is such a, a promotional tool on his own. And if you had him playing in half decent weather in Killarney, surely the crowd would be doubled or tripled. There was only 20, 22 or twenty three thousand in Croke Park because it. Bucketed yeah. down, like I mean, there would have been, I would say, ordinarily forty thousand at Dublin Mayo yeah. in a league game. Yeah. yeah, that's brutal. Um, we'll finish up now in a second. Um, I won't talk about our man Monaghan draw because Monaghan draw every game is remarkable. Just that there's there, there's 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 yeah. <laughs> there's a doctorate to be done in Monaghan drawn games in the league. In the league, yeah. <laughs> and it shows, it shows from that too, like Division One. Four, five, or six points may get you keep you safe because mm. there's going to be a lot of teams grouped in that area, and score difference is going score to score difference is big. Yeah, would make the difference in keeping yeah. you up. It shows you when you grade teams as well how competitive the matches are because we'll come to the summer now and we'll be talking about you know 18, 19 point hidings in the provincial championship, and you could throw a blanket over most teams in division. If grading works. It's an obvious Mon- thing Mon- to say. Monaghan, Mon- Monaghan, Monaghan left that game behind them though, Mikey. They were the better side for the vast bulk of it. They were down to 13 players at one point because Conor McManus was sent off mm. and I can't remember who got it. And Chutna be been. sent off, I think, too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know... Sent so back out of black card for the penalty incident. Oh, that? that's right. And yeah. they lost Niall Kearns very, very early on, who's obviously hugely influential player to them. I think he went off after about 10 mm. minutes with a with a serious injury. Um, and they still did a lot of wides. But Monaghan, like, I know they got a draw. 
they should have won that game. Yeah. Final word to you, Colin. I'm just wondering. You, you said you were in Navin yesterday. Was was that a point gained or a point lost for me? Because we kind of we put that down as a must win game for both teams. So was it a bit of a cure its egg? I was a point lost, no doubt about that. Like me had uh, the wind in the second half, and uh, we're only three points behind. And you would at half time have put the house on me overcoming that. And in the end, Caelan Mooney cut in from the right-hand side and fisted the ball, looked as if it was going over the bar, and uh, it hit the crossbar and came out. And just before that, Parry Carnan made a, an interception to stop a certain goal for Dan. So in the end, maybe it was a point game, but like uh, Dan are struggling. If you're not having to beat Dan at home, things are not good. Yeah, that's... that's uh... It's going to be making a very interesting mini league to finish off that division too between Cork, Down, Meath, and Offaly. Because mm. I think after, like, like the Cork will, will play Galway this Saturday, the, which you they won't that win. Means. But they're, but yeah, which they won't win. And then their 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 three remaining games are Meath, Down, and Offaly. So it's going to make like that that side of it to see who actually gets relegated. It's going to be quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, we'll be back on Thursday to preview the football in hurling. We've a, we've a, we've a double weekend, and we've Congress. I don't know whether we'll be previewing Congress. <laughs> yeah, we've we've done enough football <laughs> football structure chat over the last few weeks. It's done. It's done. Um, thank you to Eamon. Thank you to Colm and Rory, and uh, we'll catch you again on Thursday. Good luck. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses!